We are kicking off today in the best way possible. A fireside chat with Jen Easterly, the Director of Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, and Kelly Bourne, the Director of the Hewlett Foundation Cyber Initiative. Kelly and Jen, over to you. Thank you, Vivian. And I, I think it is supposed to stop raining tomorrow. So maybe there's room for just a little bit of jealousy because it really is yeah. beautiful here. I'm really glad to be here, Jen, with you today and could say many, many things to introduce you. I think I'll just hit the high points in noting that you, before coming to CISA, spent five years at Morgan Stanley, so have a wealth of knowledge about setting up their Cyber Fusion Center, which is really relevant here and thinking about CISA's partnerships. And before that, two tours of duty in the White House, uh, spent more than 20 years in the U.S. Army in intelligence and cyber operations, twice received the Bronze Star, uh, an honor that few uh, can parallel, and then also helped to set up the Army's first cyber battalion and U.S. Cyber Command. So really, really wonderful to get to kick today off with you. Awesome. Thanks, um, I think I'll let you speak a little bit first to just the mandate at CISA and what you, have you been on the job, I think, 10 weeks now by my count, something like that, although I'm sure it might right. feel both longer and shorter uh, for you, <laughs> depending right. on the moment. Exactly. But would love to just hear what your main sort of priorities and accomplishments have been in this initial phase, given that you're both new to CISA and CISA has only been around for two or three years. Yeah, well, first of all, great to be here with you. Mm -hmm. I'm glad we both made it in. Uh, notwithstanding the weather, we both took the adventurous uh, drive. It was a drive. Yeah. Aspen, it was great. Um, so first off, yes, asking me what I've accomplished in the 10 weeks. It's yes. like, you know, what the heck have you done over the past What, what 10 have weeks? you been yeah, doing? Thank yeah. you for that, exactly. But, you know, I, I do think it speaks to the urgency of the moment, uh, just as Vivian was saying, what we've seen. Uh, so first off, thank you for pronouncing it correctly. CISA, I know it is a hotly debated topic, but it is in fact CISA. Uh, so what are we? As you said, uh, we're, in, we're the newest agency in the federal government. We were established at the end of 2018 to be the nation's cyber and infrastructure defense agency. So essentially our mission is to lead the national effort to understand, manage, and reduce mm -hmm. uh, risk to our digital and physical infrastructure. Essentially, uh, the systems and the networks that the American people rely on every day to get gas at the pump, food at the grocery store, money at the bank, uh, to get power, to get water. Uh, it's so critical that we work with the American people to ensure that those mm -hmm. systems are secure and reliant. So that's the CISA mission. What have I done over the past 10 weeks? Well, uh, it seems like a much longer time than 10 weeks, but uh, let me talk a little bit. You know, as we were saying before we started, uh, the cool thing about this mission, different from earlier time in government, is that it is so external facing, mm -hmm. right? I mean, if our, the core of our mission is critical infrastructure, 85% of critical infrastructure is owned and operated by the private sector. So it's all about collaboration, why collaboration is baked into the DNA of CISA. Uh, and so a lot of time spent building relationships, building trust, building connectivity, both across the federal government, but importantly with private industry and with our state and local colleagues. So that's been pretty incredible. I'd say the second thing is I've got some great hires, very excited. Uh, just brought on uh, Kirsten Todd uh, mm -hmm. as my chief of staff. Many folks know her from the nonprofit world. Uh, and then last thing, I know we'll talk more about this, is the uh, JCDC, the Joint Cyber Defense Collaborative that I am very, very excited about. Yeah, thank you for that background. And so now looking, you've, you've been in 10 weeks, looking out to the next two or three years, what are you seeing yeah. as your main priorities? Yeah, it's a great question because over the past eight months, CISA has been given uh, more authorities mm -hmm. through the National Defense Authorization Act, mm -hmm. more money through the American Rescue Plan Act, right, $650 mm -hmm. million, dollars, and a whole boatload of responsibilities through the Cyber EO. But no pressure. Right, no pressure, exactly. Um, and you know, if you think about priorities, right, if everything's a priority, nothing's a priority. So as the director, I need to figure out how to ruthlessly prioritize where to put our resources mm -hmm. so that we can get the mission done to help defend the nation in cyber. So I think of it in four buckets. So, so first of all, CISA's transformation. Our good friend, Chris Krebs, right? Mm -hmm. He laid the foundation. Out here somewhere, Out I here think. somewhere, Chris, um, my good friend, laid the foundation, did a fabulous job 
building the agency, setting the operating model. Now we need to transform it to be the nation, uh, the agency the nation deserves. And that, to me, is all about culture, mm -hmm. building a culture that prizes collaboration and teamwork and trust and transparency and ownership and empowerment uh, and innovation and inclusion, incredibly mm -hmm. important to build a diverse workforce. And culture is all about how we attract and retain the best talent, and that's mm. people, right? Building a talent management ecosystem where we can attract and retain the best people so that the best network defenders in the country want to come work here. Mm -hmm. So a lot of work on that. Second big priority, federal cybersecurity. So federal cybersecurity is just part of that critical infrastructure ecosystem. Mm -hmm. A lot of work in this space. Uh, yeah. uh, there's FISMA reform. What's FISMA? Another great government acronym, the Federal Information Modern Security Modernization Act. We got to get that right. The last time they did this was 2014. There wasn't a CISA. Mm -hmm. There wasn't a national cyber director. There wasn't a federal CISO. So we need to use that to codify CISA's role. Uh, mm -hmm. as the operational lead for federal cybersecurity. And then, as we said, cyber EO, right? Huge amount of tasks. I think we lead or are a part of 35 tasks in there. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy to report that we've met our uh, highly aggressive deadlines so far. So tap, mm -hmm. touch wood. But that's all about visibility, right? Instantiating uh, endpoint detection and response capability, mm -hmm. logging. And this will really ignite some of the authorities we got from the NDAA, mm -hmm. where we can do persistent hunting on federal government networks. So important. There's modernization, secure cloud, zero trust. We just published a secure cloud technical reference architecture mm -hmm. and a zero trust maturity model. Comment period open until yeah. Friday. So please give us your feedback on that. I've already read some great feedback. So that's very important. Uh, so that's all federal cybersecurity. We can talk more about that. Third big bucket, critical infrastructure security. I know the whole theme of this conference is systemic risk. Mm -hmm. So we'll talk about how we think about the critical infrastructure sectors and then how we think about uh, national critical functions mm -hmm. because everything is connected. I'm a big Douglas Adams fan. I don't know if you've read any of that. Dirk Gently's Holistic mm -hmm. Detect Detective Agency. Everything is connected. Everything is interdependent. Everything is vulnerable. So yeah. it's how we think of functions. And so a lot of work on that, performance goals, and then working on the 100-day sprints from the White House yeah. with uh, pipeline companies, energy, water, uh, wastewater, and chemical. And then last, I'd say, is partnerships, 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 right? Yeah. Federal government, private industry, state and local, and then operationalized yeah. in part through the Joint Cyber Defense Collaborative. So a lot of work to yeah, do. Yeah, you have a busy two or three years <laughs> ahead of you. No um, kidding. Well, speaking about collaboration, which has been is something you've mentioned a couple of times with the private sector yeah. and with others in government, I think one question that has come up a lot is the division of labor between the NSA, the White House, CISA, and others, particularly when it comes to collaboration with the private sector and others. And I'd be curious how you're drawing the sort of cleanest lines between responsibilities. Yeah, so thanks for that. You know, a lot has been made of this. I personally think it's a little bit of a tempest in a teapot. I mm -hmm. think it's pretty clear what CIS's mission is, right? We, we lead the national effort to manage and reduce risk to critical infrastructure. We do cyber defense. Mm -hmm. That's two roles of the operational lead for federal cybersecurity, but we're also the national coordinator for critical infrastructure, cybersecurity, and resilience. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, Kelly, like cybersecurity is a team sport and life is a contact sport. So it's all about relationships at mm -hmm. the end of the day, why that connectivity piece is so important. I think the great news is um, we are moving into a place where it's not about turf, it's not about territory, it's not about mm -hmm. tribalism. It's about working together given the urgency of the threat environment. Mm -hmm. And so many of the folks that are in the federal government are old friends of mine uh, who are back together again. Mm -hmm. And it's great to work with such talented teammates. But I think it's pretty clear that what we need to do is to leverage the talents and the authorities and the capabilities across the federal government so that we can motivate collective action. I think that's mm -hmm. most important. You know, I would just point to one real value add in this space, and I think that's Chris Inglis, who I know we'll mm -hmm. hear from on Friday. You know, a great friend, a great teammate. I think the country is really lucky to have someone who is articulate, uh, as smart, mm -hmm. and then genetically wired to be collaborative. We talk almost every day, yeah. and he's a fantastic partner. So I think the space is uh, maybe crowded, but it's a space where we are creating more coherence, mm -hmm. more cohesion every day, so that we can get the mission done. 
Yeah, and it's really fortunate that you and Chris and Anne and others have such a long sort of history working together. Um, and then moving on to the collaboration with the private sector, I think you're in a great position having just left the private sector and, and one of the more heavily regulated industries in the private sector to think about, you know, what are the main challenges that you're seeing there? What do you see as the opportunities? Yeah. So it's a great question. Um, let me talk a little bit about the JCDC because I'm really excited about this. You know, this came out of the Cyberspace Solarium Commission mm -hmm. where so many fabulous ideas emerged mm -hmm. and then found themselves instantiated in the NDAA. You know, a significant accomplishment, mm -hmm. really. Uh, and one of them was this Joint Cyber Planning Office. And so based on that, we developed the Joint Cyber Defense Collaborative because it's more than planning. If you look at the legislation, it talks about planning, it talks about exercising, it talks about actually implementing operations. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, one of the really cool things about this is it's the only federal cyber entity in statute, in law, that combines the power of the federal cyber ecosystem, so CISA, NSA, FBI, mm -hmm. DOD, Cybercom, ODNI, mm -hmm. together with the power of the private sector to enable us to come together, create a common operating uh, picture of the threat, to plan and exercise against the most serious threats to the nation, and then to implement uh, plans to be able to drive risk mm -hmm. against those serious threats. And so when you think about some of the challenges like Solar Winds and Microsoft Exchange, a lot of that was about a lack of visibility. Because mm -hmm. we know if you can't see it, you can't defend it. We don't want the US government on domestic infrastructure, of course, but we want that partnership with those companies that have broad visibility. It's why the initial plank holders were ISPs and CSPs and cybersecurity mm -hmm. vendors. So the whole point is we can use this to see the dots, to connect the dots, mm -hmm. and then drive collective action to reduce risk at scale. So I'm really excited about that. We've kicked it off. We're already uh, seeing some of the benefits from sharing mm -hmm. broadly. And I think that that's going to allow us to really make some significant progress in this space. And I've been curious, now that you bring up the JCSC, how are you can you speak now about how you're operationalizing that? How often you're meeting? How large are the groups? What is the, what is the sort of practical aspect? Yeah, JCDC. It's like ACDC, mm -hmm. but with a J. Thank you. Um, and the J is important because it's, it may be CISA hosted, but this is really a platform for the federal government mm -hmm. to come together. And so we've already brought together the plank holder partners. There's 15 of them. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've already seen by being able to share information with some of those partners on threats that we have seen on the FSEB, the Federal Civilian Executive Branch, another horrible mm -hmm. acronym that the government yeah. uses. Um, sharing that information with the private sector, they can look and see if they see it in their mm -hmm. space and then share it back. So we've been able to illuminate actually uh, potential victims in other places mm -hmm. and we've been able to get that information out and do notifications. Mm -hmm. So we are just on the cusp of this. We've yeah. just operationalized it. But we should think of it really as a platform, right? This is about bringing together the power of the federal government. And it's not just the plank holder partners. Um, very encouragingly, we've had outreach from over 120 entities hmm. who want to be part of this. And we can pivot this as a platform for information sharing and for planning and exercising, mm -hmm. whether it's critical infrastructure, we'll probably work with the pipeline uh, mm -hmm. industry as part of this 100-day yeah. uh, sprint. And then we can work with a variety of other partners. And I think we will likely end up turning this into the election security space as we approach uh, 2022. Great. I'd love to come back to questions around your role in elections yeah, in a moment. But first, curious, um, as you mentioned before, the theme of this conference is systemic cyber risk. And CISA, of course, houses the National Risk Management Center. And as I understand it, launched the Systemic Cyber Risk Reduction Venture. And would love to just hear more about the goals of that initiative, where you see it going over the next few yeah. years. Yeah. So I think this is super cool, right? Um, I was at an event with Chris Roberti, who's at the mm -hmm. Chamber of Commerce, and he referred to the National Risk Management Center as a national treasure, which is actually kind of cool. Mm -hmm. I didn't know much about NRMC before, mm -hmm. I, before I got here, um, but it really is a place where analytic innovation happens. And one of the most mm -hmm. important things that they've done over the last several years under uh, Chris Krebs' leadership and Bob Kalaski, who leads the NRMC, 
is to essentially reimagine systemic risk. So we have 16 critical infrastructure sectors, mm -hmm. but you really can't think of sectors and silos at the end of the day because going back to All my point so about exactly yeah. interconnected, interdependent. And so you have the 16 sectors, but we publish the 55 national critical functions because mm -hmm. everything's functional, right? Mm -hmm. And so what this venture will allow us to do is sort of three things pivoting off that work on NCF. Uh, one is to understand the underlying architecture of systemic risk. So breaking down, decomposing mm -hmm. those functions into um, specific capabilities that critical infrastructure sectors will have to um, put efforts and resources against. So that's mm -hmm. important. The second thing is to develop cyber uh, metrics. Mm -hmm. Anybody who's been in this business yeah. knows the elusive cyber yes, metrics, luck. right? Uh -huh. Exactly. So a lot of important work there. It's one of the things that I hope in the NDAA, the next one, uh, they get the Bureau of Cyber Statistics, another great idea brought to you by the Cyberspace Solarium Commission. Mm -hmm. But we really need a way to better understand the environment and to measure the environment. We all know you got to measure what matters, mm -hmm. so that's important. And then the third is really to come up with ways to promote tools to enable us to um, analyze risk uh, in a systematic and holistic way. And you know, I, I would give you an example of work around software assurance. Mm -hmm. So one of the things we're focused on is part of our uh, information communications uh, technology, it's another great acronym, uh, Supply Chain Risk Management Task mm -hmm. Force, which is looking at all of the things we can do uh, to reduce systemic risk around supply chains. Obviously, mm -hmm. a big focus area coming off the back of solar wind. Mm -hmm. So I'm really excited to talk more about this. I know we've got Jay Healy, who's one of our yeah. uh, CARES I'm Act hires somewhere, somewhere yeah. out there. Um, but I think it's a really, really important project. Thank you for that. And next up, there's been a lot of congressional activity and discussion around mandatory cyber incident reporting. And would love to know, and I think you talked some about this last week, yeah. whether you support this work, whether there's any specific legislation that you've endorsed. I think having come from the private sector, you would have a really great perspective on the costs and benefits of that. Yeah, so I think it's really important. You know, as I said, we are a voluntary and a partnership agency. Yes. And so we the build- The mandates get a little harder. Exactly, in that so case, you, know, you yeah. build, our whole goal is to build trusted partnerships so that uh, companies that are impacted by cyber attacks report information, and we do have that. Um, but as the Congress has recognized, it is critically important that we get more and more information given the complex threat environment that we're all facing. And so we have seen several bills come out about cyber incident reporting legislation. Mm -hmm. uh, the administration is broadly supportive of this. Certainly CISA is supportive. And the reason why we're supportive, whether it's voluntary or whether it's mandatory, we need to get that information as rapidly as possible so that we can share it to prevent others from suffering an attack, mm -hmm. right? In a perfect world, and this is all about what we talk about collective defense, in a perfect world, and I realize this is not a perfect world we live in, mm -hmm. you would not see the same attack twice. And so we've been working. Yeah, we have not had that luck. I know, exactly. <laughs> well, I said perfect, right? It's mm -hmm. the ideal world. But the more that we can use our platform, because CISA's superpower is really our information sharing authorities. We have the most broad information sharing authorities across mm -hmm. the federal government. It came out of 9 11, mm -hmm. right? That's mm -hmm. why they built DHS. And so we can use that platform in an anonymized way, protecting mm -hmm. the civil liberties, the privacies, but sharing that information to prevent other victims from mm -hmm. falling victim to, to these attacks. And in the world of ransomware, that's incredibly important. So we are excited about the potential for that legislation, but to your point, having just mm -hmm. come from Morgan Stanley, we wanna make sure, and I've said this last uh, week, and I said it yesterday at a separate talk, that CISA is not overburdened with noise and that we're not overburdening mm -hmm. industry with reporting noise. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's really important to have this rulemaking period where we can figure out the scope mm -hmm. of the reporting entities called covered entities, when they would need to report uh, rapidly, but again, signal not noise, mm -hmm. and then how you make sure that you can do enforcement. Because at the end of the day, it really is to the benefit of the whole ecosystem if we can get information out rapidly to protect others. Yeah. 
Thank you. And now I wanted to come back to your point about elections yeah. earlier and the thoughts that you're having about CISA's role there. I know that in 2020, I think you all had launched the rumor control rebuttal site. My understanding is that you intend to continue with that. But I'm curious what else you're imagining doing in the election space, how you see that mm -hmm. changing, and how you see yourself collaborating with other responsible federal entities? Yeah. So great question. Um, as we know, elections are run by state and local officials. They are on the front lines of making sure that their elections are secure and resilient. The federal government, uh, CISA specifically, because we're mm -hmm. the sector risk management agency for election infrastructure, we are here to help to make sure that state and local officials have the resources, the technical assistance, the guidance, the information mm -hmm. that they need to be successful. And here's where just another shout out to Chris, because he and his team, folks like Matt Masterson, mm -hmm. did just an amazing job of building strong collaborative partnerships with the election security community who were highly skeptical in 2017 when election infrastructure was declared critical infrastructure. You know, I was a private citizen in 2020, mm -hmm. um, but I really appreciated what I saw and it's only been reinforced since I came into the job and met with secretaries of state mm -hmm. and state and local officials who have told me how pleased they were and how appreciative they were of CIS's role. So we plan to continue that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you hear again and again how much work went into building those relationships yeah. and that trust. Yeah, just absolutely amazing work. So um, really proud of the agency. I can't mm -hmm. take much credit for it, but we are looking forward. Um, mm -hmm. You know, elections happen all the time, as I'm reminded by officials, but <laughs> yeah. we're in particular looking towards 2022 to mm -hmm. make sure uh, that state and local election officials have everything they need. Mm -hmm. Kelly, you also asked about misinformation, so mm -hmm. rumor control. Um, I, when I looked at this as a private citizen, I saw what CISA was doing, which is really making sure that the American people have the facts that they need. You know, I worry a lot about misinformation and disinformation as a citizen, mm -hmm. but also as a mom, mm -hmm. right? If you don't have the facts, if you don't have the best information, you can't make the best decisions. So we are gonna continue uh, with rumor control and we're gonna also continue with some innovative things. We do graphic novels, which are kind of cool. Oh, I didn't realize that. Yeah, they're, mm -hmm. they're kind of cool. I'm happy I'll send you the, uh, I'll send it to you. And you know, Chris came up with the pineapple pizza. Uh, mm -hmm. Craig Newmark mm -hmm. remarked on it yesterday. So that's Chris's trademark. I need to come up with something else. It's probably like Rubik's cubes, '80s music, dragons, something. We're, work, right, we're working through. That. We're working yeah. through what our what our signs will be. But it really is about um, energizing the community, focused mm -hmm. on you know the, one of the most important things, right? Free and fair elections are the foundations of our democracy. Mm -hmm. So a lot of effort there. And how do you see that work around elections interfacing with other federal? Organizations. I know the FBI has some role here, not, you know, at least around disinformation. You have many other players involved. Yeah. yeah, the other thing I'd point to, you know, there was a fabulous relationship across the federal government in elections. Uh, if you looked at any of this, it was CISA, but we worked very closely with NSA, very mm -hmm. closely with FBI, and very closely with Cybercom. There was a task force of folks that were constantly in touch to make sure that we were bringing to bear all of the instruments of national power, mm -hmm. both to support state and local, but then to do everything we could to prevent uh, foreign malign influence mm -hmm. on, our, on our elections. And obviously this came out of 2016. So mm -hmm. it really was a team effort. And that really makes it easier for me to continue to build on the mm -hmm. quality and the strength of those partnerships across the federal cyber ecosystem. And so mm -hmm. again, um, still a lot of work to do, but a great baseline to build upon. Right. Um, now I'd love to take sort of a, a bigger step back. So we've talked about elections, we've talked about incidents reporting, we've talked about the JCDC. Having come into this new role, what have been the biggest surprises for uh. you, good or bad? What has surprised you? Yeah, so I would say you know, it's my first time in the Department of Homeland Security. Uh -huh. uh, and I honestly did not know what to expect. And I loved my time at Morgan Stanley. Great firm, great, great teammates, great mission, great culture, great lifestyle. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason that I, I got out of government was to be with my son. 
You know, mm. I was deployed. Oh, he? He's 17 now. Oh, but, so you have yeah. just a little window left there. I know, yeah. and he decided to go off to boarding school, which oh, I don't think is something uh, about me, but. Yes. Um, so, you know, I was deployed to Iraq, Afghanistan. Mm. It was the White House. I didn't get to spend much time mm -hmm. when he was growing up, and so he was going to become a teenager. Mm -hmm. I knew that he needed me. Well, how <laughs> great that you had those Maybe five years. Maybe he didn't years. think that, yeah. yeah. So we did. It was fabulous. Um, and so, you know, when, when you get the call and you mm -hmm. need to serve and service is in your DNA. So came back into government, I will tell you, this is the best job. This is the best mm. job I've had. I believe it's the best job in government. Um, and I, I think it is because it is so external facing. Mm -hmm. It's all about relationships. You know, my friend Jane Lute, the former uh, depth mm -hmm. sec of, uh, of Homeland Security and a former professor of mine at West Point, mm -hmm. she has this great saying. She said, you know, in national security, counterterrorism, intelligence, uh, the federal government has a monopoly. In homeland security, mm -hmm. cybersecurity, the federal government is just a co-equal partner mm -hmm. with the private sector and with state and local. And so it's and all about different. collaboration yeah. and partnership. Mm -hmm. And so I love it. You know, in terms of surprises, not so great. You know, the mm -hmm. bureaucracy is still there. <laughs> um, you know, uh -huh. bureaucracy is bad when you have to move at the speed of cyber, but mm -hmm. I am ready to slay the bureaucracy, slay the dragons. Um, and, you know, I think there is the sense of urgency, given what we've seen over the, the last eight months, that we can really, we're at a unique moment in time where we can make a real impact uh, on mm -hmm. the defense and security of our nation. Yeah. Well, thank you. And then one last somewhat yeah. self-serving question uh, before we have to wrap, which is I, my background is in philanthropy. Really curious as we're trying to think about bringing more philanthropy into this space yeah. and how civil society can better support government here and the private sector, what do you see as the main yeah. uh, roles that we could play? Yeah, it's a fabulous question. Thank you for your leadership uh, at Hewlett. Mm -hmm. Thanks to you and actually Eli, who supported the big nonprofit. Big shout out to yeah, Eli. Yeah, big uh -huh. shout out to, uh, to Eli. And then also I know Ron and Cindy Guler are here. Mm -hmm. We actually got some support for the uh, for the nonprofit that I set up, Thera Media. We yeah. did Cyber Nation. Uh, and I know Craig is out here as well. And so it's so important. Uh, that more funding goes to the cyber philanthropy community. I know there was a great letter published earlier this yes. year all about this and, and absolutely critical, right, at the end of the day that there's a real focus on this. You know, I think of this, I, I guess I'd say a couple things, and I had this conversation with my friend Tony Sager, who's at the Center for Internet Security. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of uh, these great organizations out there. I, I think it'd be great to figure out how some of these can come together to get to harmonize these efforts. There's a mm -hmm. lot of work on best practices. There's a lot of work on cyber workforce. So is there a way that the, all mm -hmm. the nonprofits can come together to optimize the best of? Mm -hmm. And I'd love to figure out how we can do that because mm -hmm. we, we're doing our own things in this space. We're about to award grants to nonprofits. Um, for underserved mm -hmm. communities. So that's one thing. But I think if we, if we have a focus on two big things, one is building a diverse and inclusive uh, cyber workforce. We mm -hmm. had some great, great conversations about that. And that's something I'm incredibly passionate about because I believe diversity of thought, background, and experience helps you solve the hardest problems much quicker. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is uh, building resilience, both cyber resilience mm -hmm. as well as digital resilience in terms of being able to know how to protect yourself in mm -hmm. cyber. If you level. do that from mm -hmm. the youngest of ages to the oldest, I like to mm -hmm. say K through gray, mm -hmm. um, and you make it easy on people. And mm -hmm. uh, quick plug uh, for uh, October coming up Friday, Cyber yes, Security Awareness Month. Cyber Security Month, Awareness Month. Right? It's you know getting uh, helping people understand the basics that they can do mm -hmm. to keep themselves safe online. And so I think there's a lot that the nonprofit sector can do to make sure that we're getting out to communities all over, mm -hmm. to schools all over, to do the basics, right? Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, it's updating your software, it's password managers, it's thinking before you click. Yeah. And it's, you know, I'm on this, I'm on this big campaign here all about implementing multi-factor authentication. Yes. So uh -huh. I am doing a shameless plug and, ex mm -hmm. and expect all the cyber evangelizers out there. Because um, I think if there's only one thing you can do, the industry studies show mm -hmm. you are 99% less likely to get hacked mm -hmm. if you implement MFA. Yeah. So we are all in this together. I'm a huge fan of the nonprofit ecosystem, what you're doing, what all of our teammates in this space are doing. And I hope to be able to work with all of you to advance a really important mission. Thank you, Jen, and thank yeah. you for this conversation and for your leadership My here. My pleasure. It's great to you see you. as well. Thanks so much, Kelly.